information is going to be partly data, data from the literature, partly some of my opinion, which is usually what's most important to me. And ultimately, the most important thing is this is information for you to kind of take and go elsewhere and learn more about the things you're interested in. I'm not diagnosing you and I'm not telling you to take them to treat anything. It's information. Common questions. What, how, when, why, etc. Anybody out here use natural medicines? Everybody goes, no. Got to cut back on the caffeine. So if you had coffee this morning, you were using a natural medicine. <laughs> <laughs> so we all kind of don't think about all of the things that we do on a regular basis that are considered natural medicines. Want to start the talk with some guidelines about how to choose a product if you're going to ex explore the benefits of something. First off, avoid imported products from countries where you cannot read the label of the product. Many products produced in outside the United States can contain prescription medications by nature of the, the recipe. So you could be taking something that has a drug in it that will interact with everything else you're taking and not know it. They can also have bug parts and other strange things. I'm also not very fond of something that has a proprietary blend, because you don't know how much of anything you're getting. And is the first one listed the most prominent ingredient? Maybe, maybe not. So anything that's more than five herbs, I really don't get excited about, because I want to use the, the Western medicine person in me wants to know what I'm using and why I'm using it. And I want to make sure that it works or doesn't work so I can not quit, you know, I can quit spending a lot of money a month for these products. They're not inexpensive. If it says it cures everything, run screaming in the opposite direction. If it says, your doctor doesn't want you to know this. Are you kidding me? If we cured cancer tomorrow, we'd find something else to put our money towards, something else that needs our assistance. So yeah, I want you to tell me about it. And remember that health claims need to be verified. Because these are not regulated products, they're ads, they're um, information in the literature, in you know, magazines and on the line, aren't regulated. So it's really important to know how to tease out the truth and what I recommend is that you go to several different resources. Check their web page and see if they have studies on it. And are the studies sponsored by somebody besides them? Because there's a couple products out there that are saying they're really great, but they've done all the studies. So it's kind of like, hmm. And clerks in health food stores are not healthcare professionals for the vast majority. They may be knowledgeable about what quality products they have and what they think they've seen work best, but they are not healthcare providers. And that's an important variable when you're asking a store person what they recommend. The labels. They need to have an expiration date. They should have what's in the bottle, how many milligrams, how many doses you have to take. The other day I went and I bought, what was it I bought? It doesn't matter, I bought something, and I didn't check the number of doses. Three capsules three times a day. That was silly. So I won't buy that one anymore. So check that out. Sometimes the formulation has a standardization. Look for that. It should tell you an idea of where the plant came from. Are they using the flower, the root, the rhizome? most of the products have a part of the plant that they want you to use or to be used. So we really need to check that out. And use products from reputable and established companies here in the United States. A Couple of places you can go to look for this information. This is Consumer Lab. It is a subscription website. It's not very expensive. But they have a system where they 
take a couple of different bottles of something and they send one bottle to lab A and then one lab bottle to lab B. Those labs evaluate it for what's supposed to be on the label, any contaminants, et cetera. And then they publish on their web page products that pass and products that don't. The companies have an area where they can address any concerns that are found, so that's interesting. But they also have some guidance on how to buy products. They also have an encyclopedia that's actually pretty accurate. So it's got a lot of other information on there just besides. And they don't sell anything, so it's, they don't care if it passes or not. So that's one good place to get quality information. Their encyclopedia tells you what things are supposed to be used for or what they are used for, but it doesn't promise it works. USP.org, this is a free website. United States Pharmacopeia is the gold standard on ingredients in prescription medications, over-the-counter medications, <clears throat> and they have come to work with the um, Health Products Association of America, whatever it stands for, um, to make sure that the companies that are members of this organization use quality products. So the USP sign on the bottle tells you that they are working with the United States Pharmacopeia and it's quality. Again, they don't say it's gonna work for you. But at least you know you're not gonna grow a hand out of your forehead <laughs> if you try it. The NSF has something similar. This is a list of some of the quality products that show up on those lists on the web pages a lot. You can notice that there's a whole variety of, of brands. Some are expensive, some aren't so expensive, but they're still quality. When you're looking at the dose, labeled doses are for a 70 kilogram male, about 150 pound male. If you're not 150 pounds, you may need to go up on the dose or down on the dose, depending where your weight falls. If you get a tincture and it's in a dropper, they'll say 30 to 40 drops. One, two, three, four. You're not gonna do that every time. So what you do is you do one pump of the substance, and I always count it the first time, but they're calibrated so that one pump should be 30 to 40 drops. So once you check it the first time, you can just go by what the pump does. If you put two droppers full of an extract in a cup of hot water, it's kind of like a cup of tea. So that can be another way to do it. I always recommend people try different formulations because sometimes you don't respond to a capsule, but you might a tablet. The tincture might work for you. Um, I've had people take a variety of different forms before they found one they thought was helpful. So don't throw it out if at first you don't succeed. All right, before we go into the N01 study, if I say something and you have a question, raise your hand right away because by the end I will not remember what I said. <laughs> I don't have cancer, fog, brain thingy, I'm just demented. <laughs> All right, I always tell people to do the N of one trial. The N in a study is the number of people that were in that study. And the only person in a study that's important to me is me. So if I'm gonna use a substance, I document why I'm gonna use it. So let's say it's glucosamine for my joints. I'm getting old, I like my joints to function better. Zero to 10, 10 being the most worst in my case. So the most pain in my joint, the range of motion in my joint, how many doses of ibuprofen am I taking a day? Document all of those things. That's your baseline. Then you're gonna do your study. And for something like glucosamine, you generally have to take it every day for four months. And then you rate it again, all of those things, don't go back and look at the first one, that's cheating. Rate them all again, and then see if there's been an improvement. Because it's not cheap. You wanna make sure that using it is beneficial to you. So that's the end of one study. You should do that with prescriptions you get. You should do that with over-counter anything, including the natural stuff. Just a little FYI, if you're gonna have surgery, you wanna stop all natural products 14 days prior to surgery. There can be a variety of interactions that can occur. Decreasing the anesthetic effect is not the one I really am looking forward to. So, 
And it's really important you put these products on your medication list when you're talking to your providers. Drug interactions are always a concern, whether it's a natural product, an over-the-counter product, or an herb or a supplement. Basically, we're looking at can it interact by changing the blood level of something else I'm taking? Can it have an additive effect with like maybe additive sedation or additive blood thinning? All of these things can be uh, problematic if we're not paying attention. There are some medications that have what we call narrow therapeutic windows, meaning the amount that's healthy, the difference to the amount that can be very deadly or problematic is very small. And so we really want to watch what we add to everything. Some medications, we know that they increase the metabolism of other medications, like carbamazepine or Tegretol. It's an anticonvulsant. We know that it really interacts with a lot of things. St. John's wort, when it was first becoming popular, we didn't know that it increases the metabolism of a lot of things. In fact, almost everything else you take is going to be decreased by St. John's wort. So that's a very specific, careful, 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 careful herb. And people died because of that interaction, because we didn't know about it changing the activity of some very important substances. So when you're thinking about trying a natural product or supplement, whatever, always look at the literature and see if it says anything about altering metabolism of other agents. Yes? So you said the St. John's wort does what? Decreases what? Saint, your question is, I said St. John the wart does what? <laughs> yeah, when we take a medication, it's metabolized more often than not in our liver. And many times it's metabolized by little enzymes called CYP, or cytochrome P450 enzymes. And it increases the activity of those enzymes. And so we increase the metabolism of the drug and the blood level drops. Does that answer your question? I'm sure you weren't the only one with that question. It's the pharmacist to me. I just go, yeah, I know that stuff. <laughs> so like I said, ask your questions. Are there other things like St. John's wort that um, are known to decrease the efficacy of other medications? It sounds like that one's a pretty dangerous one across the board. Are there other herbs and supplements that affect the metabolism of other medications? Correct. Yes, and we'll talk about some of those today. Um, we're really getting much better at understanding how herbs work and how they affect the body. And so that literature when you're like wanting to use saffron for depression, we now know more about its pharmacology and how it affects the metabolism of other drugs, so you can find that information. Just some more drug interactions. These are the additive ones, you know, where you get too lightheaded because you added two things that lower your blood pressure together. Negative interactions, cancer treatments that require free radicals to kill the cancer cells. Using antioxidant herbs and supplements can potentially negate that benefit. There's a lot of research going on in the, um, that area to make sure that we understand that process better. Yes, ma'am. Is it like green tea? Matcha green tea? Matcha green tea. Green tea can affect um, free radicals, but you'd have to drink a lot of it. Generally, the amount in foods of all of these things are not problematic. It's when you super supplement. You know. Of course, I can't stand the taste of matcha green tea, but that's OK. Uh, and again, it's the same. And I have friends that love it, so I don't know. I think all their taste is in their foot. I don't know. <laughs> Immunosuppressant therapy. If you're on something suppressing your immune system, those drugs that enhance the immune system, not a good combination. All right. Dietarysupplements.info.nih.gov. It's a website where they have all kinds of information on vitamins, minerals, and some supplements. And it's sponsored by the government, so it's pretty data-based and a little more on the cautious side. But it's a good place to get some information. 
And then you can go to the other side, the ones that go, ooh, everything's wonderful, and see how they jive and see which ones make your stomach go, okay, or mm. So, calcium, I'm not gonna read this slide to you. Why it's on here is I get asked, do I need to take calcium? If you have a good diet of foods that include calcium, add those foods together, kind of get the idea of how much calcium you get through your diet, and then just supplement the difference. So if I'm getting 800 milligrams of calcium in my diet, I only need 14, 400, 1400, <laughs> 400 of supplement because I've already got most of it. So I don't need to super supplement. Why I like calcium is it's really involved in our nervous system. It's calming for the nervous system. It can help us relax. And of course, it's good for bones and teeth, but it's also good for sleep. If you have those nights where you're just crawly, calcium can help you decrawl. De so it can just help you be more relaxed. It does have some interactions. So we might have to separate it by an hour or two from other things that we do. Foods are a really good source of calcium. My other friend for sleep is magnesium. You've seen those products advertised in the ones in the health food stores and some of the other stores out there. They say calm gummies, calm powder. It's magnesium is all it is. And you just can put a scoop in some water and it has like a lemon flavor or other flavors and it's just calming. And that's because it's magnesium. Again, strengthens our nerves, relaxes our nerves. It's a tranquilizing, and I don't mean like knocked you out. I mean, it's just, <sighs> and so it can also help that crawly feeling you have at night. And again, foods high in magnesium are a good thing to include in our diet. And you'll notice that many of these things have magnesium and calcium. Potassium is very important for our nervous system. If you're low on potassium, you can get very fatigued and uh, irrit irritable. <laughs> I got plenty of potassium and I'm still irritable. But, you know, <laughs> I always recommend eating foods that are high in potassium. Um, you definitely don't want to overdo on potassium because that, that can be bad for your cardiovascular system and your muscles. So just making sure you have a good level of calcium is important. Yes, ma'am? You have the, like, one... Um, that would give you a serving of potassium for the day. The one cup of bananas, one medium sliced baked potato. <laughs> I don't know why I said sliced. Um, those are good amounts of those foods to get a decent supply of potassium in your system. Per day? Yeah. Why cook spinach? Because that's what the reference said. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think it changes the uh, absorbability, cooking or non-cooking. Okay, cooking changes the absorbability versus non-cooked spinach. And a cup it's one of the things. A cooked cup of cooked spinach is a lot more dense than a cup of spinach. One cup of cooked is a lot denser than one cup of raw. So, eat cooked spinach. So all we need is one cup of bananas? Hmm? Okay. Or one banana, one big banana. These are definitely approximations. Vitamin D, how many of you get 20 minutes of sunlight every day without sunscreen on? No, we're all like slathering up and covering up. So we may not be converting the inactive D in our skin to the active D that happens via sunlight. So many of us are vitamin D deficient and we don't know it. And again, the benefits of vitamin D are listed there. Um, and it has some additive therapeutic effects with some of our uh, chemotherapy drugs. And that's just because having an adequate supply of vitamin D helps them work better. It's not that it does anything specific that I'm aware of. 2,000 international units a day, I think that's about 50 micrograms these days. Um, 
Sometimes if you're really deficient, you might get prescribed a whole lot more by your provider. Just take what they say. Do you, does the word synergistic, everybody understand what that is? Synergistic is one plus one equals four. Inst additive is one plus one equals two. One plus one equals zero is a negative bad combination. Okay, wanted to talk a little bit about um, tamoxifen and luprololine drug interactions. Again, tamoxifen is changed from its inactive ingredient by an enzyme liver called 2D6. Liver enzyme called 2D6. And so if you're on something that inhibits that metabolism, you don't change the inactive tamoxifen to its active portion, and it decreases the effectiveness of tamoxifen. So this is, would be a time if you're on tamoxifen and you want to try an herb to make sure you research to make sure that that herb does not affect that enzyme. Because Lupron works differently, it's not broken down in the liver by those little enzymes um, drug interactions like that do not occur. So we would not expect that to be a problem. Are there any supplements that replace an estrogen blocker? No. We have some that might assist, but to this point in time, we don't have one that you can take by itself and get that effect. So here's just a sample of things that might uh, affect the 2D6, valerian, and turmeric inhibit that enzyme, so you're going to get higher levels of what you want. Let me take that back. Decreasing 2D6 in this um, situation is going to decrease your tamoxifen levels. So reverse what I said. We talked about St. John's word already. Phytoestrogens in plants and supplements can counter the activity of tamoxifen. So at this point in time, we do not recommend isolated isoflavone products like capsules of red clover, uh, phytoestrogens, the isolated soy phytoestrogens, um, and that would be ginseng, dong quai, red clover, soy, that kind of thing. There's a new, re new research, excuse me, looking at specific phytoestrogens from soy looking at pros and cons, are they helpful or are they not helpful. Soy foods are fine. We're talking about the concentrated extract in the pills or the tablets. But having tofu or having soy milk, none of that's going to bother you. Options with tamoxifen, flaxseed. Um, it contains a phytoestrogen that we know is an anti-estrogen. So it works similar to tamoxifen's active metabolite. Black cohosh, there's a lot of literature looking at it. Most of the literature is leaning towards that it works to regulate the system via transmitters in the brain, not via estrogens. So more to come on that. But if you're having hot flashes, some of the $4 antidepressants that work really, really well and have been studied really, really well in this, are a whole lot less expensive than the natural products. And we know exactly what's going to happen with those. Mood swings with, if you're on tamoxifen, it's causing mood swings. Maybe a mood stabilizer will help, but we're really not sure. And then achy joints, the glucosamine and the MSM. MSM is a sulfur donating substance that helps your, um, your joints be healthy, helps your hair be healthy. And so sometimes taking that can be beneficial in those achy joints. Let's see, we talked a little bit about black cohosh. I have friends who have tried black cohosh for their hot flashes and had absolutely no benefit at all. And I've had others that swear by it. Um, I don't. Whether or not their N of 1 trial was done appropriately, I don't know. And so you're going to get people that say, wow, this is wonderful. You may try it and have nothing happen. That gets down to the uh, just because it works for me doesn't mean it's going to work for you thing. 
What do I want to say about that? Hmm. Just a slide on the PARP inhibitors. Um, I don't even remember why I put this in here, so me. If you're on one of those, you want to avoid things that affect the 3A4 enzyme. And then you have one that doesn't have any metabolism like that. And then there's one that has the 2D6 and then one that has minimal activity. That's the kind of information you're looking for when you go to the literature if you're interested in trying something. We're going to skip that one. Coffee enemas, ixnay on the coffee enema A. What's a coffee enema? That's when they take cold coffee and induce it into your rectum as a means of detoxifying your colon. Doesn't work. And we're not really sure it's safe. And it's a waste of coffee as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> There's some interesting literature about alpha lipoic acid improving neuropathies and preventing neuropathy due to um, diabetes and chemotherapy. In some of the literature, it talks about improving insulin resistance and increasing glucose effectiveness. So it's kind of an interesting substance for diabetes. I have to say I have not looked at that literature in the last year, so I would do it. I would do a research thing on your own if you're going to look at it. It's very well tolerated, though. Um, again, it's an antioxidant, so if you're on a free radical medication, not for you. One of my favorite groups, the mushrooms. They have a variety of different things they do and can do. There are some products that say they are a blend of miracle mushrooms. So you can uh, get a dropper full of much of the beneficial ingredients from the mushrooms without having to take all the capsules. And there are studies that show that it's reishi mushroom does decrease blood pressure as well as your ACE inhibitors. So this would be a, a situation if you're on something to decrease your blood pressure and you're thinking, hey, I want to do that reishi mushroom stuff because it's going to protect my liver. Well, it could also make your blood pressure go boom. So another interesting combination. Um, now let's see. Mataki improves the immune system, so that could be good, could be bad. So again, it's really interesting in um, Chinese medicine, that bottom right one that I can't pronounce, starts with an A, that's given in traditional chemotherapy in China. <clears throat> so they're way ahead of us on augmenting chemotherapy agents with natural products. And we would not understand their studies. And it's years and thousands of years of experience. When you're using herbs for millennia, basically the first time you used it, if they lived, you liked it. If they died, you didn't want to use it again. And then you'd try a different one. Over time, they found out the ones you didn't want to use because you died, and the ones you wanted to use because they worked. And they've been doing that forever. Those kind of trials, they were frowned upon in here. <laughs> Gee, they died from it. Oops. Yeah. Do you know if any companies in the United States are looking at do I know if companies in the United States are looking at herbs in combination with chemotherapy? Yeah. There are actually a lot of studies going on in that area. Okay. Fortunately, we're kind of getting with the program. Flaxseed, this is a source of phytoestrogens that do seem to be anti-estrogenic, so they can be used with tamoxifen. They do not affect the metabolism of tamoxifen um, as Partial agonists, uh, estrogen, think of estrogen as a 100 watt light bulb. It gets to the receptor where it goes and the lights come on. You get tamoxifen, it gets to that little receptor thing and nothing happens. It's still dark. It's on or off. 
Phytoestrogens like these are more like a 10 watt light bulb in the 100 watt light bulb spot. It's gonna get a little bright, but not a whole lot of bright. And it, <clears throat> and it keeps the estrogen at the 100 watt thing from parking there because it's in the way. So we get some benefit in menopause, potentially from this. Um, but it's a really good source of fiber, and it's a really good source of omega-3 fatty acids and the other fatty acids that we need in our diet. And I did say fiber, so if you do try to get the ground seed and add it to your diet so you can get more fiber, start small, mm -hmm. or you'll hate me. Huh? Because I've heard, which is better, the seed to grind it, the oil, the pill, which is the best for flaxseed? With flaxseed, what is better, the pill, the uh, oil, the... Well, you need to grind your own flaxseed if you're going to use the flaxseed. The seed contains the oil, and it also contains the fiber. It also contains the, the phytoestrogens. The oil contains no phytoestrogens, and phytoestrogens it's just the omega-3s, or the fatty acids. If you get in a tablet or capsule, um, it'll be interesting to how many of those you have to take to get the dose. But once you grind it, you have to keep it in the freezer because it's going to go rancid really fast because it's oil. So you can't just leave it sitting out. It goes bad. And I get asked, does flaxseed work? It's a great laxative. That's what I can tell you. It's an N of 1 trial if it works for your menopausal symptoms. All right. I think we already covered that. And soy, I mentioned that you can eat it. Uh, we don't want the isolated isoflavones. But yeah, you can get all kinds of sources for a good non-meat protein without having any difficulty. I got asked once before about wrinkles. How do you, what can help with wrinkles? <laughs> <laughs> not getting old. Um, we lose collagen as we get old, so we get drier and less flexible skin. And collagen supplements are touted as a way to get, you know, our skin to be more elastic, kind of fill out a little bit more. The studies are hit or miss as far as it, whether it actually works. Uh, it's in a lot of the facial creams. We'll tell you it has collagen in it. It's an end of one trial. My personal favorite would be the N of, uh, N of 1 trial with the powder because you can put it in your coffee and you can't taste it. Score. <laughs> Drink it in my coffee. Um, let's see. Prevention. Stop smoking. <laughs> sleep on your back. How many of us sleep on our back? Yeah, not very many of us. Um, antioxidant supplement, supplements can decrease the free radical damage that you get from the, in the skin from the sun. Again, not if you're on a chemotherapeutic agent that needs free radicals. So manage your stress. Take your omega-3s. Did we hear about exercise earlier today? <laughs> yeah, we did. Exercise is good for a lot of things. And keep well hydrated. Get that water in there. There are some herbs that claim to um, be helpful for skin. Got to cola, um, your natural emollients, your oils, and fruity acids, fruit acids, like alpha hydroxy acid. Always follow directions on that one because it's pretty caustic. You don't want to just start rubbing it all over your face. No, rubbing a peach on your face does not help. Biotin, B7. I see a lot of people taking mega amounts of this B vitamin for their hair and their nails. There do seem to be some benefits from using biotin, but overdoing it can cause all kinds of side effects, as you can see up there. Um, Basically, two and a half milligrams or 2,500 micrograms is the maximum recommended to take a day, and you're going to see products that are like 500 million. And you can get in a lot of different fruits that also contain calcium and magnesium and potassium. Drug interactions, 
there is some inhibition of 1B1 and that can be a problem with some of the medications. And if you take too much, it can affect the absorption of a couple of the other B vitamins and alpha lipoic acid. So again, more is not necessarily better. Ginsengs, point on this slide is these on the top contain phytoestrogens. They are very good for energy and for decreasing stress. Ashwagandha on the bottom is not a true ginseng. It's called Indian ginseng because it has a lot of similar activity. <clears throat> and at this point in time, I have not found literature to say that it has phytoestrogenic activity. But it's used for decades and eons um, in India and China for stress um, causing the growth of dendrites and axons, meaning it helps your brain grow more cells and communicate with itself better. It's calming, so if you're already on something that um, makes you tired, it might really make you tired. And it might decrease the effectiveness of in immunosuppressants because we know it improves your um, immune system. Here's my favorite herb for energy to help with um, just decreasing stress, dealing with the world, rhodiola. It's supposed to be activating, not everybody finds it activating. Um, it has a standardization of 3% rosefin. Side effects are pretty mild. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Yeah. Monoamine inhibition means that it stops the breakdown of those little neurotransmitters in our brain that regulate mood, anxiety, you know, those types of things. So we get more of the chemicals in our brain that help us feel good. So that's where some of its benefit comes from. And again, it's well tolerated. It's not without drug interaction, so again, it depends on what, you're, what else you are taking. It says caution in bipolar affective disorder. Bipolar affective disorder is a person that has major swings way up and major swings way down. And that's the caution because it does increase those neurotransmitters that can cause a tip in the balance for someone that has bipolar and they might become manic. So we don't want that to happen. Turmeric has a lot of things that says it can do. Um, I just think it tastes good. And it's anti-inflammatory. And it, there are some interesting studies about it, its ability to decrease the tangles and plaques that occur in Alzheimer's disease. Those studies are in their infancy. I think it'll be interesting to see how that pans out. Again, it upsets your stomach if you take in a lot of a big dose of it at a time, but the amount in foods isn't going to be perfectly all right. You need to take it with black pepper if you're going to take it as a supplement. So most products do have black pepper as an additive ingredient because we do not absorb it very well. Does have drug interactions, so we need to watch that. Pea glycoprotein is a um, protein that sits in the lining of your stomach and regulates how much drug you absorb. And if you stop that, then you overabsorb medications. I saw one article, and I have not been able to verify it, that they're seeing um, some of the chemicals in there have phytoestrogen activity. So at this point, I say eat it, but don't super supplement if you have the uh, hormone sensitive cancers. Brahmi is an herb that is used for memory for the most part. I have not seen a lot of good luck with that for thinking and like if you have that foggy head, I've not really seen any benefit for it there. Bacopa is the same thing you might hear about someone saying, oh, get some Bacopa because it'll help with your thinking. Again. I have not had good luck with that with people I've worked with, but 
if you have an N one trial, you can always give it a shot. It's gonna take a couple of months for it to show benefit. And again, you need to document why you're taking it, how sharp you think you are, how forgetful you think you are, because you're not gonna rem remember in two months what you were like. Do most of them have, like on the back of the <coughs> label, does it tell you like take it for four months before you see any, like how do you know, how would one know when to get the best benefit? So how do you know when, how long you have to take something to get the benefit? Yes. That's gonna be in the literature. Okay. It's not on the label. Be nice if it was. That's going to be on the Consumer Labs webpage, USP webpage, um, those types of places. All right, milk thistle, one of my favorite herbs. It helps the healthier liver, and if you've gone through chemotherapy or any other kind of medical treatment, your liver's usually unhappy. I tell my friends that over in, overindulge in alcohol. After a while, take, a, you know, take this for a month because it helps restore the health of your liver, it helps clean out your liver. <clears throat> Very few side effects. Here's the standardization. It does have some inter interactions, but it's got some agents it can be used with easily. It increases the clearance of estrogen, which could be a good thing or bad thing, depending on your situation. And people ask me if I know it works. And I'm saying, of course I know it works. Have you ever seen a finch with a large liver? <laughs> nope, because they eat lots of milk thistle. <laughs> One of our best herbs for anxiety is called kava. There are studies showing how well this works. There's a standardization, but I recommend that people only use the whole herb capsules or tablets. And I say that because there are cases of liver dysfunction with kava, and I think it's associated with us trying to isolate stuff from it. Because in the native areas in the South Pacific where they use this all the time, there's no literature saying that it's harmful. So I'm thinking it's trying to isolate all that stuff out of here. That's the problem. But again, if you start getting yellow eyes, a sore liver, if you start peeing black, or red or brown, um, stop taking it, see your doctor. But if you take it as directed, the risk of that is very small. But it has a lot of activities that indicate that it should work. And I have friends that swear by it, so far they have no problems with their urine. Valerian is really good for anxiety and for sleep. It works similarly to the medications like um, Ativan, Diazepam, or val Valium. It has mechanisms similar, but it's much milder. <clears throat> and again, there have been cases of patotoxicity, but we can't tell if they were actually taking valerian or they thought they were taking valerian and it was something else. There's not enough documentation of those cases for us to know. There's been one case of a person taking large amounts of alprazolam and took some valerian and was so snowed by it, they went into a coma. So that's a drug interaction I wouldn't go for. Just gonna touch on melatonin a little bit. Um, it's a natural occurring hormone in our system. Our little pineal gland makes it. And basically during the day while it's light, the levels increase and then when it gets to be dark, we're tired and we go to sleep and then the level falls. And then we wake up in the morning and it builds again. But because of all of these things that we use all the time, many, is, many of us don't have that circadian rhythm anymore because we don't sleep enough and we use a lot of lights. The blue light thing is the problem with this too. So I always tell people to start with the smallest dose you can find because sometimes for one or two of us it's going to be 0.3 or 1.5 that works better than taking a three milligram tablet or capsule, or whatever. Take it about an hour before bedtime. And again, because it might have um, antioxidant activity, we have to be careful there. I'm gonna touch on aromatherapy. Do you guys understand what aromatherapy is? I didn't for the longest time. I'm like, why is smelling a rose supposed to be good to me? I don't know. The essential oils are the concentrated um, oils in a plant. 
And each of those oils contains different chemicals. And it's the little differences in those chemicals when we inhale them, they go to different areas in our body and they do different things. So the products that are good for anxiety, say, they go to the limbic system of our brain and those chemicals act like medication and calm that area of the brain. So it's really interesting that they have such a variety of uses. Here are just some of the combinations where just smelling something can calm you down. It's kind of like, you know, when you smell baked cookies, it reminds you of, you know, pleasant things from your childhood, hopefully. Might not. And then if you smell something else, it might make you go, ugh, because it reminds you of something really bad in your past. Those are the types of things that you see. Some are uh, used to calm the digestive system, like peppermint, lavender spritzed on a pillow. Take a drop of lavender oil, put it in about uh, 30 milliliters of water, shake it up, and then spritz it on your pillow. You know, flip the pillow over because it's going to be pretty powerful. But that lavender scent can help you relax and fall asleep. It's also, also antiseptic, so I travel with that. And when I get to a hotel, I spritz the heck out of everything. <laughs> the remote, the doorknobs, the bed. That way it's clean. All right, so just to summarize, how are we doing? Oh, we got time for questions. Um, natural medicines outside, you know, just using them on their own and doing all the wrong things isn't going to make them health, healthy for you. So it needs to be part of a total body um, approach to health. They're tools. My tool might not be the same as your tool. Um, but if you need a screw head, you know, one of those flathead screwdrivers, using a Phillips instead is not going to work. So you need to have a variety of things in your health tool belt. So while natural sounds better, not everything natural is good for us. Arsenic, snake venom. It's not cost effective in a lot of situations. And what's good for me might not be good for you. So you need to double check the information. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. These are two web pages that do some interesting uh, reviews of the literature, and they'll <laughs> tell you exactly what they think of the outcomes of those studies. And they don't mince their words. So they're kind of fun to check out every now and then. Remember at the beginning I said if something says it cures everything, run screaming in the opposite direction? There's only one herb I know cures everything, and that's garlic. It decreases blood pressure, it's antiviral, antibacterial, it will decrease cholesterol, and it keeps vampires away. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the one herb I recommend for everybody. Yeah? So how do you take it? How do I take garlic? Well, actually, I take it in a lot of different ways, but if you're going to use it um, medicinally, it's really important that you not cook it. Because when you cook garlic, you there are active and inactive ingredients in garlic. And when you take a raw clove and you push it up, mush it up, there's an enzyme or a chemical that's released that turns the inactive ingredients to active ingredients. And if you cook it, you kill off that chemical that makes that change. So I usually do a lot of raw garlic. <laughs> it keeps a lot of people away, even vampires. Um, and when it's, if you go to a store and you see tablets or capsule and they say it's odorless, you need to make sure that they haven't heat treated it to make it odorless because that makes it less stinky, but it also doesn't make it as effective. So what I like to do if I'm going to cook with it, I will add it to the recipe like it says I'm supposed to because the active ingredients should survive somewhat. And then at the very end, I add a little more raw so that I get the garlic flavor still, but at the same time, I'm getting the benefit of the raw garlic. And they say you need about four to five cloves a day. I use dried garlic powder in a lot of things. And that, um, the dried garlic powder is usually what's in the capsules and tablets. So it's just, like I buy as a seasoning, mm -hmm. dry. Mm -hmm. Dry aged garlic powder. And again, use your, you know, your N of 1 trial if you're taking it for its anti-inflammatory effect. Exactly what 
part of my body am I trying to anti-inflammatory? Um, and then after I've been doing it for a while, what do I see? What's the difference? I just use garlic because I like the taste. You know, you get your low sodium V8 juice and you add some garlic and then you add some cayenne and then you add some turmeric and black pepper and then you chug it down. Yum. It's very good. Vodka, Vodka is optional. <laughs> you can use tequila too if you want to. <laughs> so, any other questions? Is it poisoning to fry garlic in the oil? It smells really good. Is it a problem to fry garlic in oil? Yeah. Only if you burn it. <laughs> burn it black. You, you talking about black garlic? I mean, you burn it accidentally burn it into black. If you burn it into black, basically you're killing it. You're killing it. And it also changes the taste when you cook it. Yeah. It tastes but pretty is, bad. Is it just frying, uh, before you stir fry anything, mm -hmm. fry garlic, that's usually mm -hmm. the Chinese way of uh, Tr That's correct. Right. It smells really good, mm -hmm. but some people say it's poison. No. no, I haven't seen anything that says if you fry garlic, it's poisoning. Oh, I, heard, I just saw YouTube. YouTube? Can YouTube? You, YouTube is not, not reliable. <laughs> <laughs> you want to check a couple of different references before you believe anything that's on YouTube. You know it's not, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. And you were first. So everybody at work is using Golo, G-O-L-O, Golo. I looked at that product the other day, and it is a blend of herbs down at the bottom, proprietary blend. Contains several herbs that I think you know could be helpful, but I don't know if there's enough of them in there to do anything. But it's also a combination of substances that I know science has proven don't work. So it's kind of a, a catch-22, and on is those is those tablets in my grammatical, <laughs> are those tablets really doing anything or do I just think they're doing anything? So, uh, and then that, that, that's a web page that has all the studies done by their company. That one is? Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. I think. Do I go to five, 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 five. You could check out those two and see what they say, yeah, okay. yeah. When you were talking about the, oh, sorry, the tamoxifen, mm -hmm. um, did you do any studies on aromatase inhibitors as well? Like aromatase inhibitors don't be, seem to be affected by anything okay, that, that we're talking about. That yes, ma'am. my question. Yeah. Uh, AI. Yeah. Aromatase inhibitors do not seem to have the drug interactions that tamoxifen does. It's always, you know, important to double check, but they don't have the same metabolic route. They're not broken down the same way, and they are active from the get-go. So, yes, ma'am. Does garlic or onion have some of the same effect as garlic? Onion has some of the benefits of garlic, but the total chemical combination isn't the same. Yeah. Yeah. Again, can you fry onion in the, in the oil? Yes, you can fry onions in the oil. So there's no bad? No bad, unless you burn it and then it tastes horrible. <laughs> and I've done that many a time. Anybody else I haven't gotten to? Yeah, it's like early on about different brands. So are there, how do you know, like there's expensive brands, cheap brands, how do you know, or what? Um, from that list, it was, um, yeah, Dr. James Duke was the grandfather of herbology in the United States. And he worked with a lot of companies. And so that list is from his book of the companies he's worked with that he thinks are of high quality and high quality standards. If you Google him, it should give you a list. What was the name again? James Duke, PhD. D-U-K-E, kind of like James, J John Wayne is what I was trying to think of. Yeah, and the other ones on there were things I found on companies that always showed up as quality products on the other web pages. Uh, Spring Valley at Walmart, cheap, but it usually shows up as a positive product on Consumer Reports when they check it. GNC, expensive product. It also shows up positive most of the time. So it's kind of like, what are you comfortable with? And uh, some of the health food stores will sell some of the products, and then they'll say, oh, well, that one you can only get at Walmart. And I'm like, it's still good. I don't care. So they want you to buy their expensive stuff. What about that natural grocer? They have their own. 
Uh, the natural grocer has their own products. Uh, a lot of the health food stores have their own products. They usually are rebottling somebody else's product. Um, they don't have the money to do that kind of stuff, so it's important to find out where they're getting their stuff from. They're just repackaging it. Okay. And most of the time, it's okay. It's just you don't know because you can't go to the web pages and check it out. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. You, you never mentioned ginger for nausea. Ginger for nausea? Yes, I didn't mention it. I should have. Good. Studies are good. Again, there's a couple products out there that are ginger extracts. Don't take those. Take the full ginger root products. Ginger candy is good. Dried ginger is okay. Um, you know, cooking with ginger is okay. But yeah, that can really soothe your stomach. Yeah? Is there anything specific uh, that you would recognize for pain or help, helping with uh, uh, pain medicine? Anything specific to help with pain medicine? <clears throat> or just pain itself? Pain itself. Um, Anti-inflammatory herbs are going to decrease that inflammation, which is the root of most pain. So that's where I would start. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Is there anything you absolutely tell us to stay away from? St. John's work. Okay. <laughs> it just causes too much grief. It works. In the studies, it shows it's as effective as your prescription antidepressants. But the people in those studies weren't taking anything else. So, and most of us take at least one thing that we don't want to be messed up. All right, thank you for coming. If you have any questions, I'll hang around outside.